and welcome to this evening's fireside chat with president of Oregon Institute of Technologies, um, president of Oregon Institute of Technology, Dr. Nagi Naganathan, and the chair of Oregon Tech's Board of Trustees, Ms. Jessica Gomez. My name is Mira Wonderwheel. I'm Oregon Institute of Technology's Interim Director of Development and just wanted to make sure I'm not muted as I'm welcoming you this evening. Um, the conversation this evening is a wonderful opportunity for us to usher in new students and families into our OWL community, to welcome back returning students, as well as share university highlights and points of interest uh, for our alumni, faculty, staff, and broad base of community supporters. We hope that you will enjoy this preview of what is to come in this remarkable 2021-2022 academic year. Um, my colleagues, Becky Burkeen and Krista Dara are behind the scenes providing tech support this evening. So if needed, uh, they may pop in if, if um, some technical difficulties occur, um, but thank you, Becky and Krista, for your support behind the scenes tonight. So if there are any technical difficulties, um, we've all become accustomed to this uh, Zoom world that we live in these days, but we certainly apologize in advance. And um, with that said, please be rest assured that we are recording the conversation and it will be available afterwards for your viewing pleasure. I am thrilled that we have nearly 100 people registered for this event tonight. Um, since this is in Zoom webinar format, we will be viewing our speakers only today. You won't have to worry about making sure you're on mute or if your video is on or off. Um, many of the questions that you submitted during registration have been incorporated into this evening's conversation. Um, due to you know, the limited uh, time that we have, all of the questions may not be addressed tonight. Um, with that said, we do have a question and answer uh, box in the webinar format. It's marked Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You are welcome to enter a question. And if we're not able to get to it tonight, then we will be uh, responding to those questions via email after the event. There will be a poll feature at the start of this evening's conversation. We wanna see who is with us this evening in this Zoom room. And um, we hope that you'll participate when that pops onto your screen. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Chair of Oregon Tech's uh, Board of Trustees, Ms. Jessica Gomez, um, as founder and CEO of Rogue Valley Micro Devices. Jessica Gomez has created a world class precision MEMS boundary in the heart of Southern Oregon. Integral to her role as CEO, she practices a business philosophy of offering best-in-class process, technology, and R&D expertise to customers to help them achieve the highest quality and reliability in their products. Prior to founding Rogue Valley Micro Devices in 2003, Chair Gomez honed her experience in semiconductor processing and production management through positions at Standard Microsystems Corporation, Integrated Micromachines, and Exponent Photonics. Chair Gomez is dedicated to supporting economic development. She um, serves, as I mentioned, on Oregon Institute of Technology's Board of Trustees. She was appointed by the governor to serve on the Oregon Healthcare Committee and the Oregon Business Development Commission, among others. Chair Gomez was also named to the Woman of Influence list by the Portland Business Journal. And in 2020, she received the Executive of the Year Award from the Portland Business Journal MEMS World Summit Award and Semi Foundation Spotlight on Woman Award. She is currently running for Governor of Oregon. Welcome, Chair Gomez. Thank you so much, Mira. I think I popped up my video a little bit early, so I tried to stay as still as possible as to not distract from you. <laughs> so glad so, you could be here this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a great time of year. I find um, this is like very close to my heart. It's the beginning. I feel like this is kind of our new year, you know, it's, as opposed to what we see in January, because it's the new school year, everything feels really fresh and new. Um, and it's just a really exciting time. So without further ado, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Naganathan, our president. I'll, I'll leave now. Hi, Dr. Naganathan. Good evening, Chair Gomez. How are you? I I'm doing audio. great. Doing too well? Good. Yes, very well. Thank you. Thank you Good for evening, being here. <laughs> I'm going to actually read your bio. I think mine might have been a little bit longer than this one, but I'm going to go ahead and, and read because you've got some really incredible experience. Um, Dr. Naganathan is actually our seventh president. Uh, he was, a, um, his appointment began in November, 2016 after national search. And he off officially began his tenure in April of 2017. Prior to joining Oregon Tech, Dr. Naganathan served as the Dean of the College of Engineering and University of Toledo, UT in Toledo, Ohio for more than 15 years, where he was a member of the faculty beginning in 1986, long time. Additionally, he served as an interim president during the 2014-15 and was the founding chairperson of the mechanical, engineer, mechanical industrial and manufacturing engineering department. So, and you know, when you first started, I remember um, we met and you said, have you, you're in the, you're in the uh, men's industry. Have you heard of this company, uh, Midwest Micro Devices, right? And sure enough, right. the CEO of that company, I think was a student of yours. That is correct. And it's a small world. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to um, get started here. Uh, we've got a poll going on, I believe. Um, and before we start our conversation uh, with you, Dr. Naganathan, um, I wanted to just kind of get a sense of who is here with us today, because I'm, I'm assuming we have students, um, we've got some alumni, we've got faculty and staff with us. Oh, here we are. The numbers are coming in. Yeah. So um, parents, we have quite a few parents there um, and, and others. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be having this conversation with you today. So thank you. So let's get to it. Um, Dr. Naganathan, you know, uh, for me, I, you know, I was really, really excited about Oregon Tech's um, music designation um, as the Polytechnic University of Oregon. And I just, you know, I knew it was coming. Um, it had been in the works for quite a while. Um, and now we are finally, it was finally made an official designation um, this summer. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, Thank you, Chair Gomez, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, you are absolutely right. It took some time to get it to happen. It took us almost two years. But it is more than uh, simply a designation, as people will think of it. It is not just a public awareness. It really affirms who we are as a university. You know, this gives us this, uh, defines our mission, defines our niche. It speaks for the success our students have through the applied learning experiences. And it also affirms our statewide mission. You know, uh, we are not a regional university. Our mission covers the state and beyond. So to be designated by the legislature officially and to be signed into law by our governor, it really speaks for and affirms what Oregon Tech stands for and how successful our students have been. So it is certainly a momentous occasion in the history of our university it clearly says uh, we have, we started in Southern Oregon at one time, but we have a statewide footprint and we have a mission that goes to all corners of Oregon and beyond. So that is certainly a very exciting development this year. So you mentioned about our footprint um, and I think we've got some new parents here and new students here. Can you talk a little bit about like, what does that footprint look like across the state? So we, we all know. Well, our main campus is obviously in Southern Oregon and Klamath Falls, but we also have a metro campus in outside of Portland Metro in Wilsonville. We uh, teach anywhere between 600 and 800 students there. We also have an online program, which is we have students 
from all over the country. In addition, a unique element for a public university, we have a campus outside the Everett Boeing plant uh, in Se near Seattle. So in a way, as an Oregon public university, we have a unique role teaching those Boeing engineers in Seattle. And that program has been going on for 20 years. So you, through the modalities and through the campuses, in addition, we also have a campus, a site, a teaching site at Chamaqueda. It coexists with the Chamaqueda Community College. So we have partners all across the state and it is exciting to be designated uh, with, this is a very rightful designation for Oregon Tech to demonstrate what Oregon Tech stands for and who all we serve. Thank you. You know, it's it's just really exciting to kind of hear about everything that's going on. And I know something that's been on the minds of, of many uh, parents and students and faculty is like, give us a sense of what the um, beginning of classes are going to look like. I mean, we've been through the pandemic. Um, I know that our university, we've been open. Um, can you give us a sense of what the start of what the beginning of the school year is going to look like? Well, that, that's a big question in everybody's mind. I know. And, and as you rightfully pointed out, it is not reopening for Oregon Tech. We have been open. And thanks to our students, faculty, staff, many people contributed. We had a successful year even last year. We offered lots of classes in person. And we lots of laboratories were offered in person, if not virtually all of the labs were offered in person. So we had a very successful year. This year, this is about you know, a more in-person activities, more classes in person, more activities in person, and more services in person. Of course, at no time, you want to let the guard down. You really want to always prioritize the safety, health, you know, health and the well-being of everyone involved. And we continue to evaluate the guidance, as you very well know, and as all the attendees know, this is uh, every day it changes. New rules are coming into place. So we are constantly monitoring what is going on across the state. And of course, including what's coming from Washington DC in terms of guidance. So we look at CDC's guidance, we look at Oregon health guidance. So, and we work very closely with our public health in respective areas. So uh, constantly it is a shifting situation, but we have demonstrated, even last year when there was no vaccine last fall, we demonstrated our ability to adapt and credit goes. All of them that were involved, our students, faculty and staff, they followed the protocol, therefore we had a you know, very safe year. Now, uh, many people know attending this in June, we also, uh, introduced, implemented a vaccine requirement. And of course, uh, you know, people were given the opportunity to inform us if they haven't vaccinated or if they would like to claim one of the exemptions that is allowed under state law, whether it is due to, whether it's a health exemption, it could be a religious exemption or it could be philosophical or personal exemption. So we have asked folks to in the, let us know and there has been very good response. Out of those that have responded, 90% of our faculty are vaccinated. Almost 80% of our staff are vaccinated. The student numbers are continuing to come in. Uh, it is almost 75%. So a good population has already been vaccinated and some of them have more time to let us know if they are either exempting themselves or if they have already vac vaccinated themselves. One thing for sure, vaccination and masking still remain uh, yeah, predominantly the protection for personally as well as for others, but we are close to. So the more we can do them, more successful we are going to be as a university. Of course, we don't want to simply assume everything is going to somehow work out. So we are putting a lot of measures in place. Even last year, uh, credit goes to our residence life staff. They did a great job and our students did a great job in residence halls. We had 94% occupancy last fall, and it was a very successful academic year in the residence hall. And now this year, first of all, we have a great uh, healthcare partner just across the street in Sky Lakes. They continue to offer testing. So if anybody wants to get tested at Oregon Tech, that is a very convenient mechanism to get tested at Sky Lakes. And of course, we are also looking at other ways of expanding that testing. So people don't have to worry about, will it be possible for me to test myself and get the results? 
in a timely manner. Our residence life staff, they have, once again, they have put a lot of measures in place. Uh, uh, if students have to, have to, resident students have to quarantine, there are facilities, and of course, they know how to work with families uh, in case the students prefer to quarantine at home. And uh, those measures are already in place. It was even tested last year and worked very well. Contact tracing, we will continue with isolation and quarantine as needed. Where needed, we are going to be offering training for students, faculty, and staff. So we, at no point we are going to let our guard down. As I started at the beginning, the safety and health and wellness are very important. Uh, we also have uh, two groups of faculty and staff, one looking at campus-wide reopening, other one looking at the academic reopening. Those, some of those, one of those committees has been meeting consistently for a long time. I believe our academic reopening committee or resumption committee also met today. So those things are continuing as well. So we are monitoring the situation. Another question that came related to this, I know there are a lot of questions. All these are important and we wanted to address it in this. Uh, people, uh, our students and parents have asked about class sizes as well as the, the internet access, two important things. I am uh, very happy to say Oregon Tech is known for its small class sizes. Really, almost 85% of our classes have 25 students or less. So, and that has been the case that will continue to be the case, 80 to 85% in that range. And these are all in-person lecture classes. Of course, our laboratories will continue to be small because of the number of stations available at any time that is the way we always offer laboratories. And also important at Oregon Tech, 40% of all the sections we offer are laboratories. It is uh, applied learning, hands-on learning that happens at Oregon Tech. We continue to do it well, and we hope to continue to do it even better this year. Uh, another one I wanna talk about is we are going to rely on vaccination and masking. I cannot stress the value of both of these that is going to help us to be even more successful. And uh, we are not going to be restricting in-person instruction. So we are prepared as much as we can be and then some more, but at no time we will let the guard down because people have to be uh, healthy and safe. That is going to be a very important element in all of this. Uh, one of the other questions that, I, that came is about the bandwidth and residence halls. Our residence hall director has taken special measures to improve the bandwidth in the residence hall. Ours is a concrete construction. So uh, obviously the permeability is different. So what they have done is now they have implemented access points virtually in every room, if not in all the rooms, so that there could be better connectivity for the students. I know it is very important for our students, particularly those in the residence hall. We are also currently reviewing the proposal for the village, which is the second residence hall. I also uh, was informed that our Portland Metro campus is getting a complete makeover. I am told at the end of this week, we are scheduled to finish that upgrade. So our Portland Metro students will be very happy that is in response to what they gave us as feedback last year. Uh, our athletic events, I know that is another question that came to us. Uh, we are planning to resume athletic events. We are going to follow the state guidelines. And of course we will be masked indoors consistent with state guidelines. And we are going to request people to social distance if they are not going to be, if they are not from the same household. So many measures are in place. Our rec center is open for students to use. So with everybody doing their part, I am very confident that we are going to have another successful academic year at Oregon Tech. I think in the interest of time, I tried to cover many questions, but I know these are all important questions in many people's minds. But at no time, uh, we are going to let our guard down. We are going to take every measure possible to assure uh, the safety and well-being of students, faculty, and staff at Oregon Tech. I hope it kind of answered the question you asked about resuming in-person operations, more in-person operations as well. Absolutely. It, you know, it's, it's, 
to hear all of the all of the precautions that have to be in place and the work that has gone on um, to make sure that um, students feel safe and that um, norm that we can operate normally. Um, I just uh, I just think it's fantastic and it's really evident that the amount of work that has gone into this plan and so. Um, I, I feel great about that, and I hope everyone else does too. Well, I give well, credit to my colleagues, faculty and staff colleagues who worked throughout the summer in so yeah. many different ways. And again, given our different sites, we are paying attention to the local public health situations and paying attention to those. It will not be one size fits all. So we need to be very conscious of that as well. And no doubt ongoing as yep. we move through the, the academic year. Um, that is correct. You know, we've had a lot of unpredicted things kind of come our way. So um, I know that, that you and the team will be keeping up on all of that and, and advising um, as, as you, know, you feel necessary. So um, that's, that's wonderful. I wanted to switch gears a little bit. Um, there's some questions coming in from alumni uh, mm -hmm. about potential new degree programs, uh, specifically uh, MBA and expanded offerings uh, for graduates. Uh, uh, first of all, it's wonderful to hear how we have engaged alumni. It's always good. They are in the field, and it is important we continue to hear from them. So this MBA is one of those questions. We also had questions about some other programs that at the master's level. Well, at the first of all, with the MBA, I know our university sent out a survey to sense interest. We need to have critical mass of interest from prospective students and also from industry so we can structure the MBA relevant to what the industry wants. And we don't want to simply ask a tradition, offer a traditional MBA. We want to know what our employers want. So that process is ongoing. There will be continued conversations. Also, uh, in terms of any graduate program for that matter, it is a function of the student interest, and also the faculty expertise that is available at the graduate level. So we need to create the right construct in that area. Uh, for example, renewable energy, we have had uh, questions from folks. We would love to expand these opportunities, but again, a critical mass of uh, students interested in taking it so we can have the right type of programming so that they can take the classes of, uh, on time and graduate in a timely fashion. Uh, talking about graduate programs, one of the new programs we are very excited about, that is the first professional doctorate for Oregon Tech. That is the doctorate. I was hoping you would get to this. Fantastic. Yes. I'm really excited about that. Yeah, it is. Um, in any program, uh, you want to look at the, uh, our academic division always has this conversation going on, our provost and the deans and faculty chairs. They talk about what is of interest, or what, what do our advisory boards uh, want to emphasize. So it is a collective conversation. And then we distill decisions on it. That was the case with the doctorate in physical therapy. This has been a conversation for almost a decade in the community, particularly with the rural health emphasis that has been uh, a great need that has been expressed by the community. So thanks to all the work that went on here, we were able to successfully secure the approval to offer a doctorate in physical therapy at Oregon Tech. But being a health program, there are new protocols we have to follow. We have to have the laboratories in place. We are delighted to have a very experienced uh, expert in this area to join as a program director for doctorate in physical therapy. Dr. Mark Campolo came to us from Georgia and he has practiced this in uh, multiple states, so he brings great expertise to that. He also, since then, has hired a clinical director. And a great feature of this doctorate in physical therapy, it may be our first doctorate, but then we are offering it in partnership with Oregon Health and Science University. So it is a joint degree, so both the university's seals will be on the diploma, both the presidents will be signing the diploma. So it's a high value degree for our graduates. And we have all the right steps moving forward here. Our accreditation uh, is likely to happen next year. The site visits are scheduled. And then in 23, 
we will be welcoming our first cohort of students. So it's a very exciting initiative. I know many people in the community I have touched base with, they are excited that Oregon Tech is going to offer this. Now, it is not just about the doctorate in physical therapy. This is how you begin to spawn other relevant programs. Uh, just as you know, uh, relevant to this conversation by coincidence, last two days, I spoke with experts from three different industries. One is a major chip manufacturer. The other one is a radiologist you know, who has a practice. And by the way, he, he has uh, 50 plus graduates from Oregon Tech employed. He's a very satisfied employer of Oregon Tech graduates. And the third one is uh, a company that makes hand tools. So this is in three different domains. And in those conversations, interestingly, there was a lot of reference to artificial intelligence, which we all have heard about. We hear it more and more right now. Now here is a connected conversation. Now they are looking for not only the depth, but also the breadth, whether you are a medical technologist graduating yeah. or a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer, they're saying, how can you infuse elements of artificial intelligence? Give them the basic know-how. So these gave us more opportunities in terms of how we can create new programming in the future. So I want to go back to where you started with our alumni asking about this. I want to thank them, that connection and that uh, continued awareness of relevance is going to be very, very important in what we do. So I want to thank our alumni for bringing these questions up. Wonderful. You know, that is just, I find myself even more excited about that degree program after you've kind of talked a little bit about, you know, what that could lead to for, mm -hmm. for Oregon Tech and for our students. I just uh, think it's phenomenal. You know, one of the things that we have been great at and, and what makes part of, part of what we do really unique as a polytechnic university is um, our externships, our internships, and when it comes to um, allied health and, and other sort of degree programs where there needs to be a lot of that hands-on um, practice. Can you talk a little bit about um, how, uh, what opportunities students had last year and, and if there's gonna be any changes or what opportunities for internships, externships, and then connections to um, industry students will have this coming year? Well, that's again a, a great question. You know, just to finish the, even the last one, I will go back. Interestingly, it is not only in one area. Uh, for example, when uh, I was talking to you know, a very accomplished athlete who works at in an industry where he's studying, he's developing human performance landscape. You know how to do that. And when he learned of our physical therapy, just like the AA conversation, he said, "Is there a way we can connect?" what you are doing as part of physical therapy with what you are doing in computing so we can develop new ways of improving human performance. So there are cross-disciplinary activities, not just going in depth in one of the areas only, whether it is engineering or health. So there are great opportunities. And one of the reasons these things become important and relevant is because of this question you asked with respect to industry internships uh, or cooperative work experiences and so on. Yeah, we or, had someone asking about MECOP, which is a wonderful program. My company participated in MECOP, it's, it's fantastic. Well, uh, our, as I speak with our students and employers, they, they pretty much get a blue ribbon when they graduate of, uh, yeah. as MECOP students because <laughs> the company gets to work with you for six months or longer, and they get to evaluate you as a whole person, not just your technical expertise, but also how good you are as a professional. Uh, Oregon Tech, I'm happy to say, is a regular participant in NECOP. We typically have 50 or more students that participate in NECOP. And of course, this pandemic has kind of shifted the universe a little bit. You know, some companies uh, chose to hold off or they constructed it to be more virtual, et cetera. But even in the middle of the pandemic, I learned that we have 36 students, or we had 36 students working last year as makeup students, and that number has already gone up for this year to 45 students. But makeup is not the only avenue. 
there are other ways that students are getting this practical professional experience because there are companies, as you well know, uh, they are not part of the MECA program. There are only a limited number of employers that are part of the MECA program, maybe less than 150 employers or so are in that ballpark. And we have a whole host of employers in Oregon. So uh, our students are working with those industries either on a part-time basis or during the summers and so on. So one of the appeals I will leave with our audience today and the alumni, uh, please let us know of more opportunities wherein our students can get this experience. Our faculty do a wonderful job training them in the laboratory and many of the students go take these opportunities. I'm a very strong believer in experiential education. And when it comes to our health programs, many of them have already uh, yeah, an externship program built in. Many of our health program students go for a one-year externship at the end of their program. So it is part of the certification, part of the graduation requirement, uh, whereas that is not the case in all of the programs, particularly when it comes to engineering. So, and it is not just engineering and health either. It could be in business. It could be in management. It could be in applied psychology. And uh, talking about this, Oregon Tech also has created our own ways of providing these opportunities. Our dental hygiene program runs a very successful dental hygiene clinic wherein they get to see a lot of patients, a wide spectrum of patients, so that gives them tremendous training. So they get that applied learning opportunity even through our uh, dental hygiene program. Another program I'm very proud of, and the credit goes to our humanities and social sciences department, we have a big clinic, behavior improvement group clinic in Klamath Falls, and this is a community clinic wherein children with autism get uh, treatment. And uh, I remember when we dedicated that facility two years ago, uh, mother came up to me and said, uh, her son was 20 plus years old. She said, I wish we had it when he was a young boy, a young child, uh, but I'm glad you are doing it right now. And that, community, that clinic has gotten off to a great start. And our students are in that clinic uh, getting certified and after proper certification, they get real hands-on applied training. So a uh, MECAP is a great program, but only a finite number of students get to participate in it. But then there are many other opportunities and we would love to hear from our alumni and, and parents on what other opportunities are available for our students. We would love to connect our students to it. You know, one of the things that I think um, a lot of people, well, they're starting to learn about uh, Oregon Tech now, um, and we were just awarded um, this, uh, no, we're number one now in return on investment um, for mm -hmm. our students, um, which is just phenomenal. I mean, we know that tuition and, th and things across, you know, many states in the U.S. have continued to go up. Um, and return on investment is a really big deal for students that are going out into the workforce. Can you talk a little bit about that award and what it means for, for our students who, um, who graduate from Oregon Tech? Well, that is something we are very proud of. Uh, and obviously it is very relevant to our students and their families. And I think a couple of weeks ago, again this year, it was of, uh, based on an analysis by Smart Asset the Portland Business Journal published an article. Once again, Oregon Tech was deemed the best value college in the state of Oregon. Yes. I think we had the highest index. And they look at, the, this is an objective analysis. We don't influence that analysis. They do it on their own. You know, when a student comes into the university, they are looking at a career. And to know this high value proposition is there for them is extremely important. And Time and again, every year virtually, we have been able to garner this accolade. And that is a very meaningful recognition and very important for our students and families. And that is something we are continuing to emphasize more. Uh, when I was speaking with those three industries last two days, I was speaking about exactly this particular aspect. But then how do we create new opportunities so that that value keeps going up even higher. When they recruit a student from Oregon Tech, a graduate of Oregon Tech, 
I want our industries to know you are getting a well-rounded professional, not only somebody who knows the uh, technical subject very well. And uh, that is something I'm very proud of hearing over and over again from our employers. And yeah, I uh, think, that is some, yeah. go ahead, please. I, I think the proof is in the pudding. I mean, employers are hiring um, Oregon Tech students um, and mm. their starting salaries are great. And that is that is the best kind of feedback, I think, for students and, and for our university. I mean, it's really phenomenal. Um, uh, I think the number is around $63,000 is the yeah, average starting maybe. salary. And then Higher Education Coordinating Commission also, they do their own independent analysis. And five years out, uh, I think a couple of years ago, Oregon Tech graduates, we were earning, a, they were earning about $65,000. And mm -hmm. those numbers are bound to be higher this year and beyond. So we continue to want to create that kind of value for our students. Speaking of value, I mean, there is a lot going on on our campuses, a lot of new and exciting initiatives. I mean, we talked about some um, under the degree programs, but there's a lot more going on than, than I would, don't want to say just that, but in addition to, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the Center for Excellence in Engineering? I mean, this is a um, a, a building that's under construction right now. Um, if we've got, I think we have a picture of it that we can show everyone. I mean, it's uh, it's really impressive. Can you talk a little bit about um, the seat building, Dr. Naganathan? Yeah, absolutely. This is a very exciting uh, project. Uh, interestingly, this was the first project I got to participate in, take it over the finish line when I joined as a president in 2017. It is a $42 million uh, uh, initiative uh, supported by the state. It, 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 no tuition dollars are used. It's entirely supported by state funding for this project. It was also supported by donor funds that we had to provide as a match. And our donors stepped up. I want to thank the Wendt family for stepping up to provide a large donation so that we can get this facility completed. Now, this is more than just a classroom building or an office building. The entire concept has been building an innovation ecosystem. It consists of a lot of collaborative spaces. I remember speaking with the architects when we started and they were talking about, so what's going to be the theme? I said, well, constructive collision and transparency. I want glass walls so people know what's going on behind in those labs. Let's not build too many opaque walls and doors that people don't know what kind of facilities are available. I would love for people to be able to walk by our students and say, hey, what's going on in that space? And same thing that it's going to have maker spaces. It's going to have a new cybersecurity instructional facility. It is also going to have science laboratories so there can be cross-disciplinary activities in that particular program. The building is going to be completed sometime this fall. So the students that are coming into Oregon Tech are going to be able to enjoy the facilities and help to define a new innovation space, not only for Oregon Tech, but also for the state, because we are hoping to create and spawn new innovation centers out of the activities that are happening here. And we are already in the conversation with the Business Oregon and other entities on what's possible but through this particular building. It is only a portal through which given to the imaginations of faculty, students, and staff, we hope to do a lot more with it. So very exciting project, very modern looking building as the photo showed, yeah. and it is going to look at creating the future of workforce right here at Oregon Tech. You know, when I when I looked at the plans for this building um, and just to see it come to fruition now, I mean, it makes me just a little bit jealous that I don't get to go back to school and, and take classes and, and work in that building. I mean, just phenomenal. Well, it is not only that particular building, you know, before we started on the Center for Center of Excellence in Engineering Technology, the new building, we were fortunate to again get support from the state in being able to renovate our uh, current engineering complex, the Cornet Hall. So I would really invite people to come and see all the laboratory facilities. That building, the entire building has been redone, new laboratories, new spaces, new, new computer labs. And our faculty have done a great job of designing those laboratory spaces. So uh, I think it's a very exciting opportunity. I've spoken to many students 
who are thrilled to be in those labs and they are going to enjoy it even more in the new engineering complex. And you know, another building in the works is our Boyman Hall. That is where many of our incoming students, the freshmen, the sophomore, they take their foundational classes in the sciences and other areas. And once again, we were able to convince the state uh, on the high value proposition. You asked about the return on investment. Yeah. That's what happened in this case. With that, we were able to add lobby for and secure $20 million almost in state funds. With that, we are going to renovate the facility. So our freshman and sophomore students within a couple of years, they are going to have state-of-the-art science labs and other instructional spaces involving foundational classes, whether it is mathematics or other areas, those things are going to happen in that building as well. The instructional facilities are key in terms of the experiences the students have. So we are very excited about the upcoming renovation of Boyvin Hall as well. In addition to what has happened in the Cornet Hall, as well as what's coming up in the new engineering complex in the seed building. So very yeah. exciting times. Oh, it's amazing. You know, and I think that there is um, you know, people will look at this and go, oh, it, you know, uh, this is a great facelift for the university, but it's much deeper than that. I mean, we are really, um, you know, acquiring some state of the art uh, facilities so that our, stu our students can learn and grow and, and really take um, best advantage of that. And that's going to impact, um, you know, them, their future careers, our partnerships with industry. So it, it is truly exciting um, to, to hear all of the activity that's going on. You, you talked about the industry part of it. One of the things Oregon Tech, we have done, you know, we had a very inclusive group, both within the campus as well as outside involving our alumni or foundation board. We did a brand new strategic plan for Oregon Tech. And one of the elements of the strategic plan uh, obviously, we are emphasizing student success. It has four pillars, one focused on student success. The second one is focused on innovation. The third one is community connection. There, the connection, it is not community in the social sense. It is also the industry community and others. And the last one is the institutional excellence. Yeah. Yet thread in all of this is being an industries university. And that is not only about creating, continuing to create graduates, who are valued in industry as they are right now, hopefully we can keep raising the bar on what it means, but it is also being a surrogate lab for innovation. So when we design these new spaces, we would love for our partners, our industries to come and do projects with our students and our faculty in that space so that we can create and see new points of innovation right at Oregon Tech. So, uh, these spaces are no longer just for instruction, just for offices. We should look at everything through the innovation and equity lens. That's what we are trying to do here. And many of our students mm -hmm. continue to be first generation students. You know, so yeah. depending on, I can relate. I was one such student in my life to come to a campus to see what is possible. Then you begin to imagine what else is possible in your life. And we hope we can create more opportunities here. You know, speaking of opportunities and then a connection to industry, can you talk a little bit about OMEC and uh, what is happening with the new um, additive manufacturing um, center? And that's for, for those who don't know, it's really 3D printing, which is just incredible. There's so much um, going on in this space. It's like the new sort of buzzword, but there is an incredible um, sort of amount of things that that you can do that we haven't been able to do as far as um, uh, you know, prototyping and research and development and sort of the applied piece of that and partnering with industry. Um, I, and I think there's a photo here of the, of the groundbreaking, but um, Dr. Naganathan, if, if you could really kind of t tell us a little bit more about OMEC. Well, uh, OMEC is Oregon Manufacturing Innovation Center. Uh, I'm proud to say Oregon Tech is the host for this facility. Now, this groundbreaking is for a new building that's going to come up on that particular area. But uh, there is another building on the same uh, land there. That is the Oregon Manufacturing Innovation Center R&D facility. Uh, that is focused on metal machining. It's in Scapoose, Oregon. Uh, we, uh, Boeing was the lead industrial partner around the time uh, 
I came in, there was some conversation. I want to thank our board of trustees at the time. You took a visionary bold step offering to be uh, the landlord for that facility. You know, we offered a building so yep. industries can come to Oregon. That was a risky move, but it has really created new opportunities for our students and faculty now. Uh, we started with seven industries as partners. Like I said, Boeing, it was Silver Eagle, Blunt, Daimler. Uh, there are, you know, ATI, a couple of other industries. So seven of us. And then there were three universities or partners, ourselves, Portland State and Oregon State. But then today, after just three years, it has 37 industries, not just regional, but also global. And our students are getting to work with industry experts there. And we would love for more and more students, faculty to go there and work more closely with industry. So it's not just about students going to industry or faculty going to industry to work. We are also doing taking measures so the industry can come to the university. In this case, it is coming to an Oregon Tech space in our Scapoose site. That's what is happening. It's a Scapoose campus, our only campus. But one of the more exciting recent events is the groundbreaking we saw. That is for a center of excellence in additive manufacturing. As you said, it is 3D printing, but this 3D printing is going to be state of the art. It is not just printing some small objects and plastics. We can, we, are, we have already acquired machines. There are gonna be state of the art machines. In some cases, only one of two in the entire nation that is going to be present in this facility, I wish. I had thought of producing more photos of those machines. And this is <laughs> not just plastic, it is metals, it is composites, it's alloys. And it is not simply about producing parts, it's also about producing molds so that the tooling cost can go down. That is a big cost for industries. Even just take Daimler as a company, it's public knowledge. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars each year making molds so that they can make their parts. So if you can make the mold making more efficient, then that creates newer opportunities for industries. Not only are we doing it at OMIC, our engineering college, they are working on developing a program in 3D printing additive manufacturing. We are going to have machines, of course, of instructional sizes, but these are, these are still big and state of the art. We are investing about $3 million, thanks to the support from the state, we are going to be creating new programs. So I hope our graduates will become the go-to people in terms of 3D printing in the new world, which is far beyond the plastics we do now. It is metals, alloys, composites. So it's gonna redefine manufacturing. And I want Oregon Tech to be the destination for that kind of an educational program. It's sounds, an exciting- Sounds program. like that's, uh, that's likely based on what we have going on. Just right. on. And the equipment is coming in right now and the new seat yeah. building once again is going to host some of those machines. And we are also going to have machines present on our Portland Metro campus. So industries and students can have access to it in both campuses. So that's a very exciting thing that is underway. Absolutely. So a little bit about sports. Can you tell us about <laughs> the bringing home the gold campaign and the renovation to track and field? I know that, you know, we've got our women's track team is just phenomenal. I mean, we've got some really amazing athletes um, also at Oregon Tech. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening on the sports side and, and with the renovation for track and field facility? Well, uh, thank our, again, once again, our women's track team, cross country team won the national championship two years ago. Even this year, there is a series of high finishes. Our basketball team finished runner up uh, nationally. So in the NAIA tournament, and uh, there are many other great performances that our athletes, our student athletes put out. And no, we got to don't. meet some of our team at a, at a board meeting, a few, few board meetings back. I mean, just really amazing. And they take up some very imposing and rigorous academic programs <laughs> while they are also excelling in the track. So I'm delighted to say our improvements have not been just in the classrooms. Our rec center has been completely redone. Our students stepped up, supported it, and helped to define it. And I'm delighted to say the completely renovated rec center is now open for use by for students and of course faculty and staff 
they also have and, access to grid. And I think we have a picture, don't we, to pop up for that so people can see what it looks like. Do we have a photo of the rec center today? Um, oh, track so this of, is the know, track. It is. Yeah. Uh, maybe I will talk about the track now that the picture is up. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what are we, oh, this is the track, additional track pictures. I'm excited to say our our track, by the way, sits on a with a on a in a place with a beautiful view of the lake, the Upper Klamath Lake. That's a, a wonderful uh, venue, and of course, it has it hasn't received attention in a long time. So thanks to there was some state funds left with that. Our foundation, I want to thank our foundation board that stepped up to raise uh, almost a million dollars to support this endeavor. We are going to have a brand new track that you uh, that you saw in the previous photo. I don't know if you can bring up the uh, previous photo again. Uh, and we also saw the photos of two great athletes here. Uh, Dan O'Brien on the left, uh, he is from Klamath Falls and uh, he's a decathlon gold medalist. And uh, he has become a face for this campaign. And uh, I also uh, got an acquainted, a dear friend, Ashton Eaton, who won the decathlon gold not once, but twice. So both of them have become the faces of this campaign. And I remember speaking with Ashton and he said, you know, I, I ran on the track as a high school athlete. So he still had those fond memories. And <laughs> today both of them have given their names and our track athletes are super excited about what is coming. And what's also important, it is not just an Oregon Tech facility. It is going to be an asset for the entire community. It already has lights, so we could potentially host tournaments, uh, conference tournaments there. And uh, that is only one part of our athletic improvements. Thanks to Mr. Stilwell and um, his family, we have the softball field, which has been completely renovated. Our softball team, uh, they do a great job. They have done repeatedly very well in even national tournaments. And that facility has been completely renovated. So it is very important we provide a comprehensive experience for students. It is not just great experiences in the classes and the laboratories. It should also be a great student life experience. We are paying attention to that also. So these are going to be great uh, and exciting avenues open to our students when they resume this fall. Our track facility is supposed to be completed. Uh, this September or October. So it's going to be open. The track will be open for people. Uh, that'll be great. Now, before we, I know we're kind of getting a little bit close to our any time, but before we do, I want, I, I want to, if you could talk a little bit about the one-time funding that we got from the legislature. Um, and and a, there's another really exciting thing happening, which is our, our new residence hall. If you could just quickly kind of give us um, you know, uh, what those one-time funds um, will be used for and, and how impactful that will be for our students. Well, once again, building on the return on investment uh, in the last few days of the legislature, there was a sudden opportunity and they, uh, to get some, attract some new funding. It will be one-time funding. I look at it as an angel investment in the startup. We were able to build on what our faculty and students have already done in the area of cybersecurity, which is a relatively new program, but successful program at Oregon Tech. We have a new data science program. Our computing systems program has always been well received. So we pitched a possible center of excellence in applied computing. So we received some funding there and we are developing the scope of that activity in consultation with industries as a new year starts. Our provosts will be working with our deans and faculty and the departments on what is possible as part of it. The other one, again, I talked about the behavior improvement group, big, uh, big clinic. We are going to expand. That is one of the rural health initiatives. So the part of the funding will go to expanding our rural health initiative and doctorate in physical therapy, dental hygiene, uh, applied behavior analysis, perhaps other areas that will come out of this. So those are new opportunities, but again, how do you invest it in a strategic way so it creates more opportunities for students long-term, not just in the short term? And very quickly to touch on residence hall, it's another exciting project. Our current residence hall is a little dated as some of the new parents <laughs> can relate to on the new students. 
I'm very excited to say we were also able to get, thanks to the support of the board and the legislature, uh, get a new bonding authority for a brand new residence hall on the Klamath Falls campus. Uh, we are still scoping out and we have a group of faculty, staff and students that will be involved in the new year in defining what the uh, residence hall will look like and you know, how many beds, uh, but that will be a brand new residence hall for our students. We expected 700, 800, whatever range, it depends on the design and what we would want to do within this. So it's, it's a very exciting initiative for our students that are coming in and choosing to be resident students at Oregon Tech. I feel and like that's just like the icing on the cake after everything that's that's happening and all of the amazing initiatives and investment and new degrees. And now we have this this wonderful space for, for our students when they come to to live on campus. I mean, just uh, I'm just I'm really thrilled. Well, depending on how it is designed, we can create new living and living learning communities. So yeah. there are lots of possibilities already. They are being done by our staff. They do a great job of student involvement, involvement and belonging. I know uh, they are uh, creating new programs. So lots of good things to talk about. I know the time is running out on us today, but uh, I hope more people can come to the campus and, and they see what our students are enjoying will continue to enjoy along with our faculty and staff. We are very excited about the new year. And Hello, Mira's back. <laughs> Welcome. It's just been so, we're so enthralled by the conversation. It's just been a pleasure to get to listen in to the two of you collaboratively discussing so many of the incredible initiatives and programs at Oregon Tech. It's just been really enjoyable on our end. So thank you both. It's thank so, you. so fun. So many awesome oh. things are happening and I hope uh, you and attendants are enjoying the conversation as well. Well, uh, may I ask one question? I have to ask at least one question of uh, Chair yes. Gomez. Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for your service on our board. You have given awesome service. You are one of the inaugural trustees uh, for Oregon Tech. And thank you for your service now as the chair of the board. But what's exciting about your service? You are a very busy person. You still choose to make time for Oregon Tech and our students. What's exciting about Oregon Tech for you? Oh, you know, there's been so much over the years. I'm, I'm a founding board member. So to see um, just all this incredible activity happening and the value that we're able to, to deliver for our students, um, that, that's what really um, gets me excited. I am, I'm thrilled about being number one in return on investment. Um, really excited about industry engagement and becoming the the um, industries university and and the polytechnic um, designation is really important. I think will help better communicate what we actually do at Oregon Tech. So I would say those are like my top three, along with the fifty other things that are going on at the university. Well, thank you and thank you for your service and support. That's very important. Thank you. Yeah, it's just Mira. I know we are going more and more here into your time and. <laughs> It's a fabulous conversation. I think we have lots of people still on, on the line. So we're glad you stuck with us through the conversation. And I think it's been worthwhile, which is why so many have. Um, well, we're gonna wrap it up with some fun questions. Not that these other questions weren't a lot of fun, but <laughs> we may get to know you both a little bit better. Uh, the first one, so these are rapid fires, so just uh, answer them, you know, quickly. Is it and for me or for Chair Gomez? Or we're going to do, this will be for both of you. Okay. And um, <laughs> let's start with Chair Gomez and then uh, you, Dr. Nagi. So okay. this one should be easy. Uh, what was your first car? Oh, I had a gray Grand Am and boy, was I proud of that car. <laughs> I was really excited. Well, my first car was a 73 Oldsmobile. It looked great. It had great vinyl on it. What I did not know, it had a lot of holes under that vinyl. So it was raining inside the car. <laughs> I remember there was a lot of water in the trunk. After so <laughs> I drove it for a while. So. That's wonderful. <laughs> oh, what was a recent book that you read? Jessica first. Oh, you know, I've just finished this book. It's called Nothing More Dangerous. Um, it's probably one of the best books I've read in a very long time. It's about life and death and 
there's a racism component um, and a coming of age story. I mean, just really incredible. So look that book up. I, the author doesn't come to mind to my mind right now, but really fantastic read. Uh, in my case, I actually began to reread a book I read many years ago. I found it on my shelf the other day. Mm. It's by John Gray, and uh, it was very meaningful for me at a phase in my life when I read the title is How to Get What You Want and Want What You Have. You know, in life, the second part is so important. Sometimes we lose track of it. I um, This is the second or third time, third time I think I'm going to be reading that, and it's, a, it's something I find very meaningful, kind of achieves a new equilibrium, I guess, in my mind. <laughs> very good, I'll have to pick that one up. And next, who has been one of the greatest influences in your life professionally? Um, Chair Gomez? Oh gosh, there have been so many. You know, my grandmother was a, a bilingual teacher, an incredible, an incredible woman. And I really looked up to her. She had a career, she was independent, um, and she really pushed me to, to do the same. And, and she's just been both personally and professionally an incredible influence. And, and then, you know, there was a, the CEO of the first startup company that I ever worked for um, was just phenomenal. And, and he um, he pushed all of uh, all of his employees to be more entrepreneurial, and I think um, that's part of the reason why you know I ended up starting my own company is because that you know having that as an expectation is really empowering. Um, and so I just I really appreciated his leadership as well. Well, uh, to come from where I came from in a small town in India. You know, in a lower middle class family, obviously many people touched my lives. I could not be here today, but for so many mentors in my life. But uh, I got to think about my high school teachers. There were four high school teachers I had. I had many wonderful teachers. And at that time, I didn't know what it meant, I will say. I mean, the way they encouraged and got me to believe whether it is reading English texts or whatever, you know, they, they kept encouraging. And I think they have had a formidable impact on my life. So. One was a math teacher, one was a social science teacher, one was an English teacher, the other one was also a math teacher. So four of them, one history teacher. Yeah, the fourth one was a history teacher. So, I mean, I just, it's not only the subjects they taught. Uh, they used to invite me to their home so that I can prepare for an elocution competition. I mean, they just touched your life in such distinctive ways. Didn't expect anything else. Yeah. So uh, I think very, periodically, I think of them very highly. And rightfully so. Great mentors. Well, I think um, we couldn't end on a better note of honoring uh, educators. Um, so let's close with the rapid fire questions there. And again, just thank you so much, Chair Gomez, for um, being a part of this conversation. Dr. Nagi Naganathan, thank you. Appreciate you. Um, and especially thank you. Um, those who sat in and joined in virtually. Um, we do look forward to bringing you more of these throughout the year. Um, we're planning to offer qu a quarterly speaker series uh, this academic year. Um, and we have some great events coming up in October and it, throughout the fall. Um, we talked about some of the great renovations happening on campus. Uh, we are having a Cornet Hall ribbon cutting and uh, open house that will be tours on October 7th. Also on October 7th is Hootie's birthday bash. Um, this is gonna become an, an inaugural event. Yay, um, Hootie. Yeah, I know, <laughs> Hootie's birthday. <laughs> and then, um, and not on the screen because they're sold out is we have a sold out alumni Seattle Mariners game and also an the annual Lithia Golf Challenge that's happening this Sunday. So lots of good things happening um, as well. At the end of October, the inaugural Howard Morris Hall of Fame will occur. So we hope that you'll be joining us. You can always find more information at um, oit.edu or alumni.oit.edu. Thank you for joining thank, us. Thank you, Mira, Becky, and Krista for your special efforts for today. Thank you, Chair Gomez, for joining today. And thank you. And thank you, everyone. Um, this is a lot of fun. So thanks for having me.
Fantastic. Go Owls. Go Owls. <laughs>